Hi, everyone. Hi, Carol. Thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction and for organizing this, uh, this conference entirely devoted to Zulf Anamar. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a little jokey thing. Um, since uh, time is precious at the moment in our laboratories, and uh, also I knew Thomas's uh, title a little bit earlier. So um, this is what happened yesterday. Um, so a police officer came into our uh, lab and said, get out, get out, um, get out into that Spanish sunshine. Um, and it turned out that there was a gas leak in the road. So we had to be outside for quite some time before we got back to our experiments. Um, so this is Sven here, a um, graduate student in our lab who, who works on Zulf Anamar. And what's he doing? He's got his cell phone out. And what's he doing on his cell phone? He's doing Zulf Anamar. Um, so admittedly, this is uh, simply logging into our uh, instrument remotely, but it illustrates the, the potential of technology to, to bring Anamar more into our hands. Okay. So, so with that out of the way, um, this tutorial is um, more of an opportunity to get familiar with some of the spin physics in Zulf NMR, particularly at zero field. Um, and as a motivation, I want to start with this spectrum of a mixture of two carbon-13 enriched compounds, um, acetic acid and bromoacetic acid. Um, this spectrum here was measured in a magnetic field of 1.4 Tesla, a proton frequency of about 60 megahertz. Um, so if I um, assume that you're familiar with conventional NMR, um, this spectrum is easy for you to interpret. So we see multiplets consistent with the chemically shifted Lamo frequency perturbed by J-coupling splittings, which differ in the two molecules. So carbon splits into uh, a triplet for the, the CH2 system in blue um, and into a quartet for the CH3 system in pink. Um, and all of that information uh, is more than enough to resolve the identity of the, the two compounds. Um, now, this is a spectrum of the same sample at a very low magnetic field of one nanotesla. So that's a billion times less field. Uh, where normally the Lamo frequencies are uh, below about 10 or 20 millihertz. And then clearly this is a, um, an NMR spectrum very different to the one that we're used to in high field. So firstly, we're seeing no carbon-13 or hydrogen region of the spectrum um, and only a couple of peaks per molecule. And those peaks occur at multiples of uh, the, the carbon-hydrogen scalar coupling, not chemical shifts. That spectrum has no chemical shifts at all, uh, but still this is enough information for chemical resolution. And despite the confusing peak pattern, um, the line width is, is nice and narrow, even without any shimming. So these couplings can be determined more precisely than in the uh, 1.4 Tesla field, where the line width was about one hertz. Um, and so the, uh, the material that I will cover in this tutorial is aimed for you to take away this. Um, while we observe um, animal spectra in Zulf, which may seem unusual, the underlying spin physics is not so unusual, or at least in, in the basics that we'll cover. Um, so we'll consider what, what does Zulf mean? Um, what's the difference between Zulf and conventional animal spectra? Is there some middle ground between those? Uh, how should we interpret a zero field spectrum like the one we just saw? And I'll divide that into two parts. So in the first part, I'll be focusing on very simple spin systems with only one type of J coupling. And then we'll go into uh, some more advanced behavior. And in between those, we'll have a little break uh, to talk about some of the research going on in our lab. And we may have time to squeeze in a, a live demo of Zulf NMR. Um, okay, so to do that, um, we're going to start with the idea of uh, what the NMR spectrum is measuring. So generally, that's some bulk quantity of the, the NMR um, ensemble. 
which is physically measurable, um, such as the total magnetization of the sample or ensemble versus time. Um, and then we Fourier transform that into a spectrum. And that gives us the frequency and amplitude of uh, the independent modes of magnetization in, in our system. And normally we use quantum mechanics to understand those modes. So if you're a quantum mechanics expert, you can write the NMR signal down like this if you want, uh, where H is the spin Hamiltonian, uh, which tells us how spins interact with their environment and with each other. Uh, and it defines these energies uh, that define, uh, that determine rather the, uh, the frequencies that we see in the spectrum. Um, and then H also defines uh, states associated with those energies. Um, and that relates uh, to how much of uh, a particular frequency that we see in the spectrum. So how much of a frequency is observable. And um, generally that quantum description is very useful because it's a way to calculate the spectrum um, or quantify various parameters that define uh, H. Um, and we can also use the analytical results of this formalism um, to understand phenomena which are not obvious from simply looking at the spectrum. So that's what we'll be doing in this uh, tutorial. Um, somewhat trivially then, let's look at uh, how that formalism works for uh, NMR of single spin half systems and think a bit about Zulf. So single spin half systems would include, for example, noble gases and some small molecules like water that contain singly um, or single magnetically equivalent nuclei. So really this uh, des describes um, equivalent spin system. So we write the Hamiltonian uh, for the nuclei in a magnetic field uh, along Z, where IZ is the operator for spin angular momentum along the Z axis. And then um, we generate from that the eigenstates and the energies of the system. And then we can take out the products of these to make uh, the various uh, spin modes um, and then calculate their frequencies. Um, so this should all be very familiar. Uh, we see a, a single uh, frequency, uh, which is the Lamo frequency of, of the spins in the magnetic field. Um, so as we know, this gives uh, Lamo precession in the xy plane. So it's these x and y angular momentum operators that, that result in the uh, uh, the observable. Um, and then one thing that I want you to note, which maybe is obvious, uh, maybe it's trivial, that the basis states here are independent of magnetic field. So that means for systems that behave as a single spin half, uh, then the NMR spectrum is the same in all magnetic fields. Uh, it's simply oscillation at the Lamo frequency. And we see that uh, in this example, say at high field, uh, uh, we detect Lamo precession from spins polarized in the transverse plane initially, and we're detecting some transverse component of the polarization. And this is also true at very low fields um, of uh, only a few hertz. Uh, we see a single peak at the Lamo frequency of the spins. So this is uh, a result obtained uh, detecting the NMR signal using a, a magnetometer. And uh, here one can set the uh, initial state to uh, magnetization along the x-axis. And then we're also measuring something like magnetization along the x-axis. And you'd say that's not really very useful, but uh, of course, many single spin NMR experiments, they, they, they can benefit greatly um, from low fields because the demands on field homogeneity are more relaxed. Um, so this is nicely illustrated in many papers. This one from the, the Berkeley lab um, involving a squid detection of a mineral oil uh, at millitesla and microtesla fields. So in a millitesla field, um, there's a, apparently a 10 uh, part per thousand in homogeneity in the magnetic field. So that broadens the line width to about one kilohertz. 
and then at micro Tesla field well um, and that in, in homogeneity is, is scaled down so it results in uh, a line width of a thousand times less or around a hertz and then the resulting narrower line width uh, has a greater signal to noise um, so you can obtain the spectrum uh, in about one percent of the measurement time and then uh, a similar example from our own work involves uh, this paramagnetic cobalt oxide um, on silica, uh, on porous silica, which was then filled with decane. And off on the right here, we're looking at the proton precession signal at two different magnetic fields from the decane. Um, and the line width is about 30 parts per, per million um, due to the, the, the inhomogeneity in induced in the field by the, the paramagnetic uh, cobalt atoms in the material. Um, but again, the mic at the micro Tesla field, that's scaled down. Uh, so the line width here is below one hertz. So we could, in principle, resolve J couplings, um, even if not chemical shifts. And then a quick aside, by the way, um, if we have a magnetometer, we don't always have to measure Lama precession. We can also measure uh, the sample magnetization parallel to the main field. So um, as you saw, that in that uh, has a frequency of zero. And then the data here, um, we recently measured this using an atomic magnetometer. So on the, uh, the vertical axis, this is the magnetic field that the, the magnetometer sees as a function of time. And then this square waveform is produced by repeatedly applying uh, 180 degree pulses uh, to the nuclei, which repeatedly inverts the sign of the nuclear polarization along the, the z-axis. Um, but, but in between the pulses, the frequency is zero. And then there's some eventual decay of this signal caused by relaxation. Um, so as this is uh, I Z, this is close to the time constant T1, um, but it's actually not uh, uh, exactly equal to uh, T1. Um, that's because of additional decay from pulse imperfections. Um, so in the jargon of NMR, one might call this T1 star relaxation or some kind of single scan T1. Um, so in principle, this can be done at any field. It's simply that magnetometers uh, work well at, at low magnetic fields and also at high magnetic fields, you're, you have a balance against field stability. Uh, so this technique was used in um, a number of relaxometry experiments in this paper here, again, by the, by the Pines lab. Okay, so we move on um, now to a spin half pair, and um, here things get much more interesting. So for a spin half pair, uh, we, in addition to Lamo frequencies, um, caused by the, the Zeeman interaction, we have uh, so-called uh, isotropic or spin-spin J couplings. Um, so here, if we repeat that quantum mechanical recipe, we get four spin states you know, with these energies. Um, and note this time, both the energies and the states uh, change non-linearly with the magnetic field um, due to uh, this term here, delta, which is defined as the vector sum of J and the difference in the Lamo frequencies. Um, so we could take differences of, of these to obtain the allowed frequencies. And since there are getting many of these terms, uh, I'll simply tell you the ones which appear in the spectrum. So this looks like the, the average Lamo frequency plus or minus J plus or minus delta. And then, um, so as delta is a vector sum, uh, it means that we can look at two limiting scenarios. Uh, one where the, uh, the Lamo frequency difference is much larger than the J coupling. And, we've, and we can identify that as uh, happening in high magnetic fields. Um, so in that case, delta tends to the first part. And what we recover are transition frequencies, which are the Lamo frequencies of the individual spins plus or minus J coupling. So we know that if you have a, if a weakly coupled uh, pair of spins a half in a high magnetic field, you see a spectrum that looks like this. Um, 
So we know that. But in low magnetic fields, what happens? So when J is larger than the, the difference in normal frequencies, um, so there, there we tend to the average normal frequency plus or minus J and the, the average normal frequency. These, these are the two uh, possibly observable transitions. Um, so we're going to call this the strong coupling limit because J is much larger than uh, this term. And in between those, um, there's this there's strong nonlinear dependence of the frequencies with fields. And we're going to call that the, the strong to weak coupling crossover. So um, it's easier now to, to look at some simulations of, of that. Um, one scenario here is uh, of two nuclei of the same spin species. So let's take two protons um, and some reasonable parameters like a one ppm chemical shift difference and a J coupling of 10 hertz. And if we do that simulation, uh, what we see is that this strong to weak coupling crossover happens at fields of about 0.1 to 1 Tesla. So at high field, you see a uh, uh, peak at each uh, uh, Lama frequency of the, the INS spins split into a doublet with a separation of J. So that's weakly coupled in high field. And then at the, the lower fields, we tend to a single line uh, at the average Lama frequency and at the average Lama frequency plus or minus J. Um, but note that there's one observation here that we didn't make so far. Um, and that's how the outer peaks of each doublet um, have a vanishingly small intensity towards increasingly lower field. So at much lower fields, uh, there's really no information in the spectrum about the J coupling. Um, so let's look at another scenario now, which is for uh, two different spin species coupled together. Um, so two spins whose gyromagnetic ratio is different. Um, and we're going to choose carbon-13 and hydrogen, so the most common spin species in, in organic molecules. And the first change here is that the, the gyromagnetic ratios differ by about 25% rather than PPM. So the frequency difference is much larger at a given magnetic field compared to chemical shifts alone. Um, and as a result, this strong to weak coupling crossover happens at a much lower magnetic field. Now it's only a few micro Tesla. Um, however, the spectrum has some common, common features with what we just saw for, for two hydrogen spins. Um, so again, we start with two doublets in, uh, in high field. So one of them is here that corresponds to hydrogen. One of them is here. It's a little bit hard to see because uh, the carbon nucleus is four times less magnetic than the hydrogen nucleus. Uh, but what we see again is that the, the two inner components of the, the doublets tend towards the average Lama frequency, but that tends to, to zero. So, so these tend to zero frequency. Um, while the, the outer peaks, these tend to the average Lama frequency, again, plus or minus J, um, or simply J in the limit where the Lama frequency tends to, to zero. Michael, I'm sorry, can I interrupt? There is a question. Uh, can you explain what uh, the graphs on the right? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, you see that there's some color coding in these arrows here. So um, these colors correspond to the, the data which is shown on the on the plots. So the top plot shows the it represents the intensity of uh, that transition, mm -hmm. and then the label gives the magnetic field at which that intensity occurs. Mm -hmm. So um, if we went back to the and again these are simulated. If we go back to the two proton case and you looked at the outer peak here. Um, the intensity of that goes asymptotically to zero as we reduce the, the field. Whereas uh, that of the inner peak increases um, and it ends up with a finite intensity at, uh, at low fields. And, and then in the case of 
the carbon hydrogen pair, if uh, if we take the outer peak, uh, that tends to a, a finite intensity now down to nano Tesla fields, and in fact it would stay finite intensity even at zero field. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom plot represents the um, the frequency of that peak as the function of magnetic field. So again, the uh, the inner peak tends towards the average Lamar frequency. Uh, and the outer peak tends towards the average Lamar frequency plus or minus J. So it simply ends up at a J at the end, at the low field end. How was uh, that? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good. Can I ask uh, something else? Um, so this uh, low frequency um, peak, which is a central peak, uh, how it depends on the magnetic field and uh, so I know that it can be distinguished in fumaric acid from OH signal, right? So it depends uh, differently. It should depend. I'm can sorry, well, I'm not sure what you mean about fumaric acid. Can you can you uh, give some more background to that? Yeah, so in the fumaric acid, uh, there is OH uh, signal, uh, uh, which uh, can be observed at low frequencies when uh, there is certain non-zero field and also uh, uh, a peak coming from uh, triplet uh, from the triplet coherences uh, of CH3 group. So they are split, uh, meaning that they have different dependence on the magnetic field. Uh, and if you can just comment on that. Um, OK, so I think that's um, a slightly more complicated case. So you're talking about a molecule which has more than two coupled spins. Okay. And poss possibly more than two um, in equivalent spin environments. Um, I see. I, so I see. I, I think that that's beyond the scope of this simple model. Um, I, I think maybe we could come back to that. Okay. Um, in one of the question sessions later. So, so this uh, simulation is simply meant to illustrate the behavior for a spin half pair. So we have some interesting behavior in, in Zulf um, or even down to, to nano Tesla field um, compared to the, uh, the single spin case. Uh, so again, to summarize those, um, so for homonuclei uh, protons, then we saw a weakly coupled system uh, above about five Tesla fields, whereas for um, the carbon-13 hydrogen pair, we saw what looked like a high field spectrum uh, at slightly above the, the Earth's field. Um, the similarity is that the inner transitions coalesce to the average normal frequency in both cases. Um, also, the outer transitions coalesce to the or tended to the uh, average Lamo frequency plus or minus J, but the intensity van vanishes here in the proton-proton case, uh, but it does not vanish in the case of the uh, proton-carbon case. Um, but that's something I haven't explained right. Um, and, and of course, the classic example of this is, is formic acid, so it's uh, definitely experimentally observable. Um, OK, why, why is this then? Um, well, so there's, there's actually a general rule uh, which is not uh, only specific to spin pairs, um, that we need at least one heteronucleus to make J couplings visible in this strong coupling limit or low field limit. Um, and then the crucial difference uh, is that we, uh, we need nuclei with different gyromagnetic ratio. And so I'd like to work through a proof of, uh, of that quickly here. Um, so you can see why it's true and why it's general. Uh, so coming back to our quantum mechanics, uh, if, we, uh, so if we consider this part, which is the interaction of um, the, the spin mode with the observable, um, we, we need this, uh, this quantity here, which is called a transition dipole integral to be non-zero. Um, so if we pick the observable here as uh, magnetization, um, we can write that as 
the um, proportional to the uh, in terms of operators, the the operator for angular momentum, the I spin multiplied by its gyromagnetic ratio, and the operator for the S spin angular momentum uh, multiplied by its gyromagnetic ratio along the axis of magnetization that we're interested in. And then we can rewrite that as some kind of uh, anti-symmetric and symmetric product. And what it turns out is that this term on the right here gives zero um, contribution to this uh, integral uh, for the frequencies that we're interested in. And the reason for that, so uh, again, there's a bit more quantum mechanics. The Hamiltonian here uh, for spin-spin coupling was I, so, I dot S, and that's all we have in, in zero field. Um, and it turns out that that commutes with this term here. So if it commutes with this term here, it means that um, um, eigenstates of, of the, the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of this X angular momentum. Um, so if, and then there's one more step of the argument, which is that if, um, if we have two states, uh, two eigenstates, um, which are, um, have the have the have different eigenvalue, then they must be orthogonal to one another. Um, and what we want here is is this condition. So we want uh, this to be non-zero um, for transitions which have a non-zero frequency. Okay, but if this is an eigenstate, then we can simply maybe it's easier with the pen. So if we establish that uh, these are eigenstates of this operator in zero field, we can simply put that term over there. So multiply that by some eigenvalue. Um, maybe something like A of J. And then if these two terms are orthogonal to one another, then, then we must have an integral of zero. So that, that's the that's the part here. Uh, we, lo we lose um, any contribution of this term to transitions in the NMR spectrum, which have a, uh, um, a non-zero frequency. So then let's look at the term on the left. So this term on the left is zero if we have two nuclei with the same gyromagnetic ratio. So the, con the, the conclusion there is that um, that we will have zero intensity at any non-zero frequency um, in the case of um, spins with the same gyromagnetic ratio. So that's why you need to have uh, at least one heteronucleus in the molecule. Um, so I think this is a good point to break for some questions if there are any further ones on the material covered so far. Right now I can't see. Ah. Okay, so there is one question. What happens in solids? Mm. I, I can I could continue for a very long time about the, about that. Uh, I think that let's let's simply uh, stick to the basics um, where we're talking about uh, isotropic spin couplings in liquids. Sure. Okay, uh, so, so I'll move on. Yeah. Um, all right, so we, we covered the basics for two spin system. Um, I'm sure you're wondering what happens when there are more than two spins. So in this system, uh, in this uh, section rather, um, let's look at some zero field spectra of uh, some larger molecules uh, like these, but to keep things simple, um, we'll only consider those where there are still only two chemically inequivalent species. Um, so they still contain only one type of heteronuclear coupling. Uh, for example, here between carbon and, and carbon-13 and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen, and fluorine and hydrogen. And um, so the spin Hamiltonian here at zero field uh, still only has one term. Um, 
it has or it can at least be approximated as having only one term um, given that we know the homonuclear spins are equivalent and therefore couplings between them are unimportant. Um, and the reason I'm going to show these is that the eigenvalues are very, very easy to calculate using a, a pen and paper method. And uh, it's a method based on angular momentum addition. And this works in the following way. So um, uh, this Hamiltonian can also be written as uh, a product between the total I spin angular momentum, uh, say where I is proton and uh, the total S spin angular momentum where S is the other nucleus. Um, and we can rewrite that in a convenient form if we consider the total angular momentum of all of the spins. So that's I total plus S total. Um, so we, if we do that, then we can transform the Hamiltonian into this form here, which looks a bit strange at first. And you also may wonder how you do that. So it's very simple. If you don't know, uh, you simply take Let's take uh, f, square, uh, f squared. So f squared would be i uh, total squared plus s total squared uh, plus i total dot s total multiplied by 2. And then we can simply take these uh, these terms here over to the left and then divide by two, and then you've got this term here. Now, hopefully everyone can see that. And then from here, it's very easy to calculate the, the, the energies. Um, so the, the expectation value here uh, of a uh, square of the angular momentum operator is, is simply given um, if you know the angular momentum quantum number, so for f it would be f times f plus one, and for for i it would be i times i plus one, and s it would be s times s plus one. Um, as a result, from um, simply adding the angular momentum and knowing what quantum numbers are available, then we immediately know the quant um, the corresponding energies from from this formula. So, I'd like to return to um, the system from the beginning of the talk and, and do an exercise. So let's predict how the zero field spectrum of this system looks. So you start by writing down um, possible values of the I and S quantum numbers. So if I is, is um, hydrogen, we have three hydrogens, so the possible values can be three halves or one half for the, the total hydrogen angular momentum. Um, and then the possible values for the S spin angular momentum can be simply put, simply a half because there's only one, one spin half particle. Uh, so now what about F? Well, we can combine these using the rules of addition of angular momentum. So that's uh, simply going from I plus S to I minus S in steps of one. So for three halves and one half, we would get uh, we get two and one, and uh, for half and a half, we would get one and zero, and both of those ha are own, have a difference of one, so there are no more possibilities. And we can do that for the other system as well. So these are the possible quantum states of the, the nuclear spin systems in these molecules um, at zero field. So then we simply plug the quantum numbers into this formula you can do that, calculate uh, f, f plus one, et cetera, and then determine the energies. And then all we need to know, um, given the energies, is which transitions are allowed. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about these, uh, these rules, um, but the allowed transitions, they, ob they obey um, the following. So the change in uh, S angular momentum quantum number has to be zero, and likewise for I. Uh, and that that really comes because uh, there's no interaction in the system which breaks magnetic equivalence at the I and S spins. 
uh, or INS bin subset. Uh, and then we also have delta F is plus or minus one. Um, and then that comes because um, our observable magnetization corresponds to a vector quantity, um, the magnetization of the spin system. And I'll leave, I'll leave it to you to check out uh, why, but uh, um, so um, angular momentum uh, uh, vector is a, a spin operator of total angular momentum one. So if you want to, um, if you want to connect two states, then you, know, then you need to have at least a, an angular momentum of uh, oh, plus or minus one. Well, it can't in fact be plus or minus two. So if we do that, uh, we check which transitions are allowed. We find for the CH3 system that we have an allowed transition at J and 2J at zero field, and then it's 3J over two in the CH2 system. And then that's exactly what we saw in the spectrum earlier. So we're able to um, then interpret this spectrum of a mixture in terms of the uh, the coupling of angular momentum at zero field. Michael, there are two questions on this slide. Uh, can you please come back? So first uh, is a question from Daniela. How does the total signal integral of the J spectrum depend on the spin topology of a molecule? Are there general simple rules to estimate it for a given spin system beyond two spin system, two, two spins? Um, Okay, I think a short answer to that is that there there are rules to uh, to calculate um, the the intensities. Uh, what we've only done here is calculated what the transition frequencies are, and these rule um, uh, these intensity um, the, the process of calculating intensities is also based on coupling of angular momenta, and this involves quantities like. Uh, Wigner symbols um, and, and clebsch gordon coefficients. These are all, um, uh, this is all of, uh, say, framework which you can easily uh, have programmed into a computer. And I know that a number of spin dynamics packages will, will do this for you. Um, so we're, we're looking at this particular case because it's very easy to calculate the um, the energies and the frequencies of the transitions on paper. Calculating intensities is something that uh, is less easy to do on paper, but it can certainly be done analytically. Right. Uh, also, there is a question uh, from John, I guess, from uh, for, about uh, selection rules. Aren't uh, delta F equals zero transitions allowed? Uh, yes, absolutely. So delta F equals zero transitions are allowed. Yeah. Um, in this particular case, uh, then I don't think that um, it, it's worth complicating the discussion with delta F is, is zero. Uh, in fact, delta F is zero um, simply corresponds to, uh, well, there are no transitions here with delta F equals zero, uh, which have uh, a frequency other than zero. Yeah. But um, I guess that so, uh, so say delta f equals zero can arise uh, and be observed in near zero field spectra, um, as opposed to say NMR spectra at zero field. Yeah, that's it. Okay, um, and here's another example um, of that case of. Uh, say a one, one, one spin coupled to two spins of the same species. And again, you get this three halves J pattern. Um, so I'd like to summarize this part of the talk. Uh, so although it was a bit involved in terms of theory, um, we used basic quantum mechanics principles that we should all know uh, to predict what NMR spectra look like as a function of field and at zero field, provided that we know these three things. We know the Hamiltonian, we know the initial uh, state of the, the system, and we know what we're observing. Uh, we went through some example for single spin half and some interesting things that can happen in ZOOF. 
and um, and then coupled spins. Then we moved on to zero field NMR, um, looking at this uh, approach of uh, adding total length of momentum. And if there's a single coupling between all of the unlike spins, then there's a, a simple pro um, method to calculate the energy uh, of the spin states using the squares of the angular momentum. Um, so I'm happy to take any more questions, but uh, also the intention was to have a little break from the theory and talk about some of the Zulf NMR science which is going on here in Barcelona. So your call, um, Kiru. Yeah, I can see a new question, so proceed, please. Okay, well, I'll start with a little bit about our group very quickly. Um, uh, so we're, say, a small group, but part of a much uh, larger lab um, uh, owned by this uh, gentleman, Morgan Mitchell. Um, so we are uh, a, a lab um, interested in experimental quantum optics, uh, which is uh, all to do with science of the interaction of um, light and matter and, and the quantum physics of that. Um, we have three different uh, research topics. Um, so looking at single atoms interacting with light or even single photons, uh, we're also looking at uh, magnetization phenomena in uh, uh, in ultra cold spin ensembles like Bose-Einstein condensates, um, and then something more uh, familiar to the, those of us who are, who are in Zulf NMR um, uh, that we are um, using hot vapor magnetometers uh, to measure magnetic fields such as uh, magnetic fields which come from biological sources like the brain and um, we do things like uh, miniaturized uh, vapor cells uh, based on rubidium uh, optical pumping uh, that in principle you you have a cluster of these over over somebody's head and you can localize the source of magnetic fields in, in the head and then, um, so within that that portion uh, of, of the lab, a sub-program is, is Zulf NMR. Um, and our main interests there, uh, we're interested in doing relaxometry below the Earth's field, and we'll have a little bit more about that shortly. Um, we're interested in any kind of hyperpolarized uh, NMR system uh, interacting with optical magnetometers. And we do some uh, development of pulse sequences to control nuclear spins in the Zulf regime. Uh, and we're also doing a lot on compact instrumentation. So this is uh, our, say, tabletop uh, Zulf spectrometer. This is a magnetic shield. The action happens inside that. And around that, there's some optic system which uh, does the, um, the optical probing uh, within the magnetometer. And something that might interest uh, Many of you, uh, we have been producing these uh, circuit boards which, which have everything that you need on them in order to do Zulf NMR. Um, if you're interested in those, then get in contact after the, after the talk. Um, so to go through a little, little bit about our apparatus, um, I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, this is what the, the magnetometer looks like, at least the part inside the magnetic shield. So we have a little box of glass and um, that contains a small quantity of rubidium, which is our sensor, the equivalent of our NMR probe. And um, we use light, we shine light through that, uh, that rubidium cell in order to measure uh, the magnetic field experienced by the atoms. And uh, in an NMR experiment, we put a sample above here and we measure the, um, the magnetic field produced by that, uh, that NMR sample. So I don't want to go into any more detail on that because I'm sure we'll have two fantastic talks about that tomorrow by Dima and Chimon. 
Um, but to show you uh, a little bit uh, what what other hardware we have here, so that's the, the bottom part. Uh, on top of that, um, we have some coils which are not shown in the photo. Uh, we have a, a solenoid coil which provides a magnetic field along this axis, which um, is for uh, armor precession. Uh, and we also have a, another coil, another solenoid coil, which produces a much stronger field of about 20 millitesla. And that's to pre-polarize our spins in the sample. Um, so we're, we're doing, uh, let's say, an in-situ pre-polarization in contrast to the shuttling type approach, which uh, Thomas outlined in his talk. And then some basic numbers, so we can, um, it's possible for this magnetometer to be tuned to any Lama frequency between uh, zero and about five kilohertz of proton. Uh, we can change that on the fly simply by changing the magnetic field at the rubidium atoms. And I don't want to go into detail on that. Uh, if you want to know, uh, you can go and look at my perm talk and uh, maybe I'll post this in the chat or something, the URL, so that, so that you have it um, where that's all explained. Uh, Michael, sorry, there is one question about um, this uh, setup. Uh, does this solenoid field of 20 millitesla magnetize the mu shield? Question from Raman. Well, not that we have um, detected to date. So it's possible, well, it's in fact possible that the shield has been magnetized, um, but magnetized to a steady state. Um, in other words, that repeated pre-polarization uh, uh, does not further magnetize the shield in a way that changes over time. So, um, and, and we don't mind that because you could simply compensate for that with uh, with another coil which cancels that field. All right, and um, there is one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is one more question. Uh, the residual field inside uh, change, it's important for zero field shimming. Yeah, so, so this is question from Peter. Yeah, so uh, again, I think I'd point you to this video to find the answers to those sort of questions, but there are extra coils inside the magnetic shields uh, which allow us to control background fields mm -hmm. and uh, set background fields to to the values that we want. I guess this answers the question. Thank you. Um, OK, so. Uh, and then an example of uh, what we're able to detect here. So forgetting the zero field NMR for a second, we're going back to proton precession, say in water. Well, this is proton precession in orange juice. Um, and the sample here is a single uh, vesicle from an orange fruit. So we are pre-polarizing the water in, or the hydrogen, rather the hydrogens um, in the water in, in the orange juice uh, in, in a sample which is in, say, one of these small glass vials. Maybe you could see that on the, on the video. These disposable vials. Um, and we're measuring the Lamo frequency here at uh, a Lamo precession here at uh, only a few um, micro Tesla field. And this, even the 20 milli Tesla pre polarizing field, doesn't require that many scans um, to, to obtain a signal. Uh, and I think this is quite nice so that, because the spin polarization is extremely low, it's about 10, 10 parts per billion. Uh, okay, I think we're going to go uh, over to the lab now, and uh, we're going to go over to Sven, who will show us uh, a live demo of uh, T1 relaxometry at, uh, at Zulf. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. So what we're going to see is um, I'm going to demonstrate you a T1 um, demonstration. It will hopefully only take um, five minutes. So let me quickly guide you through the pulse sequence. So we first will we'll apply um, about 1.5 second long pre-polarization pulse in the order um, of about 20 millitesla. We then um, turn the field off and uh, let the sample relax for some time. And after that, we will apply uh, a pi over two pulse to, to rotate uh, the spin. And after that, we will acquire the signal. And 
we we basically during all the time we have a background field which uh, determines the the rubidium uh, the the proton llama frequency, and we can simply change the llama frequency um, by typing a number that's for just a number a random one of 314 hertz, and if you run the experiment, we should see after a short amount of time um, if we choose the right polarization time that there is um, a proton llama precession signal at the llama frequency that we just set. And to make um, a T1 relaxation measurement out of that, we simply have to repeat that measurement um, with different um, with different uh, relaxation times, uh, with different um, um, yeah, there's times between the pi poles and the pre-polarization times. So that's what we do here. We basically repeat the measurement over and over again. Um, we will then monitor the amplitude of that um, of that peak to to see what the relaxation rate is. And we try to analyze that in real time. So let's just um, open a Python script, which uh, quickly does that. What you see here is. Um, Basically, the dots here are the measurement points. It's basically just the Fourier transform that you see in the top left plot and plot here. Um, we plot that for different, um, with different tau times. Um, we then um, fit complex Lorentzian functions to that to extract the, um, the amplitude. We plot the amplitude in the top and uh, bottom plot here, uh, fit an exponential decaying function to that, and from there we extract. The, the relaxation rate. The sample we are using um, is, is just a, a one millimolar temple solution in, in water, so we expect uh, a relaxation rate of about 0 0.9 for, for that sample. And um, yeah, basically the take home message is that you don't need a lot of polarization, you don't need a lot of time to extract useful information um, out of um, a zero field or a solve relaxometry experiment, which is polarized with only 20 millitesla. If there are not any further questions, um, I would suggest to go back to Michael's talk. Fantastic, Sven. Yeah, thanks, Sven, for the fantastic demo. I'm glad it all worked out. So the reason why we're doing these type of relaxometry experiments is that we're interested in studying relaxation processes in the in the zero to Earth's field range. And um, again, without going into much detail, because this is covered in the perm talk, um, we're interested in slow dynamics in of liquids which are confined inside porous materials. So this sample is uh, a decane hydrocarbon uh, inside a porous gamma alumina. And here we're doing a, uh, a fast field cycling uh, NMR relaxation measurement in Zulf. So this is the pulse sequence that Sven showed, um, except we're doing something slightly different, which is that we were able to change the magnetic field uh, where, the, where the relaxation happens. And so we, we repeat uh, the T1 measurement for different fields, and we can end up plotting this sort of curve, which shows relaxation rate as a function of Lama frequency. And then the way in which relaxation rates change versus Lama frequency tells us uh, about the character of the, the material or uh, the decane molecules inside the material. And um, here, if you compare this with um, uh, theoretical models of relaxation, uh, what you find out is, well, the experimental uh, dependence on field, which is something like a power law with a, with a low exponent, that's more consistent with some kind of restricted uh, diffusion effects happening uh, of decay molecules near the pore surface. So we're, we are we're measuring um, uh, these sort of relaxation curves for a number of uh, systems and uh, observing uh, what we can uh, extract in, about the dynamics. 
So um, now I want to move on to the second part of the talk, and uh, I'd like to discuss zero field NMR again, um, but in larger spin systems. Um, but again, keeping simple. So, um, so I want to um, address uh, molecules which have more than two magnetically inequivalent nuclei. Uh, for example, in this molecule, which is methyl formate, uh, there are three inequivalent groups. So there's the, the hydrogen here, the carbon 13, uh, and then there's the, the hydrogens in the methyl group. Um, and then furthermore, I want to address uh, why zero field NMR of um, carbon 13 compounds tends to be popular. Um, well, firstly, there are lots of interesting molecules containing carbon. Um, but one of the things that you'll find is that um, one bond couplings between carbon and hydrogen tend to be quite large. So between one and 200 hertz. Um, while over two or more bonds, then uh, J couplings uh, tend to be much smaller. So they're usually about 10 hertz or less. And then a nice thing, uh, uh, a nice consequence of these different magnitudes is that very often we can simply approximate um, the, the whole system as uh, the, the directly bonded carbon and hydrogens as some kind of zero order spin system. And then we can take all of the other hydrogens which couple into that as a perturbation. Um, and this uh, this is powerful enough that it makes it worthwhile often um, uh, working with uh, systems at low natural abundance or, or going to the trouble of enrichment. So I'll take this methyl formate as a first example. Um, so the zero field spectrum is given here on the right, and that's extracted from, from this paper here. Uh, so there's an experimental spectrum at zero field in red, uh, and some simulated spectra here below in black. Um, so uh, one of these, the, the dashed lines, is where they take uh, the blue coupling here as a reference system, uh, which if you remember back to our first part of the talk, has a peak, uh, a single peak at zero field, simply at the one bond uh, carbon hydrogen coupling. Um, and then they apply the more distant couplings in, in pink as perturbations. And as you can see, there's a very good match, um, even at first order then in these, uh, in these longer uh, range uh, couplings. And then, of course, it's even better at second order. So I want to show you how that works again using simple pen and paper exercise. So we're going to start with the, the formate group uh, as the reference system. So we did that in the first part. Uh, we learned how to calculate the energy levels of that system. So that's simply a singlet and a triplet separated by the one bond J coupling. And the only difference this time, um, uh, for reasons that will become clear in a minute, is that uh, I choose to denote the total uh, spin angular momentum with this name uh, FA instead of F. And then we want to include the couplings to the methyl group as a perturbation. So there are three hydrogens here. Uh, it means that we can have a coupling from this reference system to a spin, uh, total spin one half or total spin three halves, and we'll call that IB. Uh, and then this is the coupling Hamiltonian here, uh, which is going to determine the energies. So that involves couplings between the two uh, hydrogen uh, environments and the, and the carbon and the hydrogen environment. Uh, so if we want to work at first order perturbation, well, then the correction to the energy levels is like this. So what you do is that you, you take the, um, the first order or perturbing Hamiltonian, uh, and then you make the diagonal representation of that, so diagonal in the 
in the basis states of uh, the reference system. Um, but then uh, if we want to work this out on paper, there's a little bit of trouble. So it's actually, uh, uh, we don't have an easy way to calculate uh, the integral with these operators here. So S dot IB and IA dot IB. Um, we can't take the squares like last time. Um, but I'll show you a little trick. So fortunately, there's a way out. And um, that, again, is uh, relying on, on these perturbated couplings being small compared to the coupling between I, A, and S. Um, so I'll explain that in, in the following way. Um, this picture here then shows a vector model of the reference system. Uh, where we see the IA and the I and the S angular momenta um, uh, and how they evolve. So they sum to the angular momenta F, um, but then these two are coupling to each other at, at uh, their J coupling frequency. So geometrically, what this looks like is uh, these two vectors processing uh, around FA with uh, a frequency equal to the coupling. And so now what we're trying to do uh, is couple IB to that system, the methyl group. Um, and the idea is that the coupling between IB and IA and IB and S is much weaker. So we can, in fact, take an average of, of this picture before we start coupling IB. So we can say that this is approximately the same thing as coupling uh, IB to the the average value of IA, uh, which is simply the component along FA, and then coupling IB with the component, uh, the average component of S, which is again the parallel component. And we know here in this case, because we have one of each spin, and they have the same angular momentum quantum number, um, that then the length of each of these vectors uh, is simply half of FA. And then then consequently, we can uh, rewrite the, the coupling Hamiltonian uh, like this. Uh, so now this is like the average coupling, um, or rather the coupling weighted by the angular momenta of each uh, IA and S um, coupling with B. And then um, this term is much more convenient to deal with because we know what the FA and, and IB quantum numbers are. So we're in a better position to calculate the energies. Uh, we're in a better position because we can use the same trick that we did before. Um, so we can define another total angular momentum F. This time it's F A plus I B. Um, and so we can rewrite that. We can rewrite that coupling F A dot I B as uh, a sum involving the squares. And then, um, Again, we know the as long as we know the values of these angular momenta uh, and their, their quantum numbers, uh, their allowed quantum numbers, then we're able to simply write down the first order energy in this uh, in this very simple form. Uh, so let's uh, take an example. Uh, let's try and couple the reference system to IB equals three halves. Um, so if we do that, uh, let's say we couple the triplet uh, FA equals one to the to IB is one half, uh, then we have two possible values of the total angular momentum. So that's three halves and one half. Uh, and then if you go through and work out the energies, then you find out that uh, that there's uh, there's um, degeneracy breaking. So you now split into two sets of levels. Um, and if we couple uh, the singlet state to uh, to IB equals one half, well, since it's a singlet state, then again, only one angular momentum is allowed. Uh, still total angular momentum of one half. Um, and we can follow through and see that the energy change of that to first order is zero. So OK, we've, um, we've calculated the first order energies then. Um, of the spin states of this this whole system uh, taking i equals one half for the methyl group. Um, 
I'll leave it as an exercise for you if you want to do it for three halves, but it's a bit harder. And then that result is consistent with the bottom right picture of the figure here. So you can see um, the splitting of that triplet here uh, into two levels. Uh, so that's by three quarters of the three bond and four bond J coupling. Uh, and that can also be measured as the difference between these two transitions here, uh, which you can see in the spectrum. So what we've done is gone from the molecule and a perturbative uh, approximation of the, the uh, zero field NMR frequencies. And we've ended up with some information that allows us to help interpret and assign the spectrum. So we don't have to go from um, uh, a, a direct calculation of what the spectrum would look like from a Hamiltonian as a way of interpreting what the peaks actually mean. Um, I think I will invite some questions here if there are any. Um, yeah, let's ask, but uh, right now I can't see uh, new questions in the chat. Um, so what I want to talk about one more thing about um, carbon-13 in zero field. Um, so one nice feature is that the line widths can be extremely narrow. Uh, so, um, well, sometimes to the point where we wonder if there are some extra effects coming in um, beyond, say, an absence of field gradients in zero field. Uh, so if you take this spectrum here, which is uh, carbon-13 formic acid, here we have a line width of 32 millihertz for the peak at the J-coupling frequency. Uh, here in this benzene, certain peaks get down to uh, uh, low tens of millihertz. Uh, and then this combined with the fact that in these molecules with uh, large numbers of spins uh, and splittings uh, to nearby coupled protons, um, this this leads with a lot of um, leaves us with a lot of information to um, to fit J couplings, particularly at the strong J coupling of the system, uh, with very low standard errors. So uh, errors entering the the micro hits range, uh, which is really good if you want to know J couplings very precisely. So that's one um, one possible selling point of uh, the Zorf techniques. There is one one actually question uh, from yeah. Whatever happens to dipolar relaxation, surely the mechanism is still active in the liquid. Uh, and again, I'm not sure what you mean by the question. So um, maybe maybe it will become clear if I move on. Um, so I am going to talk about dipole dipole relaxation. Um, Maybe you were hinting that dipole-dipole relaxation is somehow absent in these systems, uh, which is not true, but um, we'll, we'll see that there is some strange phenomenon going on. So, uh, um, yeah, just added a rotational modulation of uh, dipolar couplings. Um, so uh, generally, uh, when you go to low magnetic fields, uh, relaxation uh, processes end up um, uh, getting in the so-called fast motion regime, uh, where you end up with, um, say, the, the relaxation mechanism uh, not being sensitive to any particular axis of the, of the spin system. Um, I, I think that I'm not. Uh, I, I think this is too too detailed to go into here. Yeah, um, actually, I'll this to to Ilya's lecture uh, later in the week on relaxation. Sure. Um, so let me try and explain what's going on here. Uh, so I'll start with uh, formic acid. Um, so in formic acid. We observe at zero field a peak corresponding to this transition, which, if you like uh, to express it in terms of um, spin operators, can call IZ minus SZ. And if you go through the relaxation theory, uh, what it turns out is that um, uh, for dipole dipole relaxation, so that's relaxation under 
rotational modulation of this coupling between the carbon 13 and the hydrogen. Um, it turns out, and I'm not going to go through the derivation, uh, uh, that that's about three times slower than the relaxation of I Z plus S Z. Um, so this this term here, um, you you might think relaxes with T one. So that that's um, that's identifying this uh, observable quantity here in zero field I Z minus S Z as something called a long lived coherence. Um, so it, rela it relaxes slower than uh, what uh, than what you would classically expect for for, for that uh, for that form of spin order. Um, and I'm going to put the derivation down here uh, as an aside for those people who who are interested. Or you can look this up later on on the YouTube tutorial. But it simply drops out that uh, I Z minus S Z is an eigen state of uh, or is an eigen mode of the of the spin system. Uh, and it relaxes with a third of the relaxation rate of of, of T1. Uh, that, that's simply the point that, that you should know. Um, so uh, what I want to uh, uh, talk about now is that when we come to a molecule like uh, benzene, uh, maybe we could rationalize the lines uh, using some kind of argument based on long-lived coherences. And I'd like to introduce this um, uh, this approximation based on perturbation theory. Um, so if we ignore all of the, the the weaker couplings in the system, and we can simply consider hydrogen uh, hydrogens which are directly bonded to carbon thirteen and have large J couplings, so there's only one of them here. Um, so we would expect if this were the only J coupling in the molecule. For there to be a long-lived coherence uh, of this spin pair, uh, we're going to consider what happens when we start bringing in the other hydrogens. Um, so, if we have a coupling to another uh, a spin in the molecule, we might expect this long-lived coherence not to be in eigen mode of the spin system anymore. Uh, we might expect it to couple to other eigen modes. And if we were using the density matrix uh, or, or um, Louville formalism uh, to, to describe the spin dynamics, we, we might write this type of equation uh, where we have, um, we bring in terms which couple uh, long lived coherence uh, with some other form of spin order that we're going to call Q, QJ, um, which may have their own. Uh, eigen frequency and they may have their own relaxation rate, which is much faster than that of the long-lived coherence. Um, and then, so we could describe that coupling by some effective coupling, which I'll call J primed, and that would generally be a function of uh, uh, these all these couplings between this reference system and all the other protons. Um, but I would expect that to be. Um, um, uh, also a function of the, the the two forms of spin order that you are trying to connect. Uh, so as a result, we'll simply call it a generalized uh, uh, if or effective coupling constant. Um, but then what we're going to do is make some uh, assumptions here. So let's assume that if, if this is the uh, the strongest uh, coupling in the molecule, uh, let's assume that it's also stronger than the the, the relaxation rates here, uh, and that it's also uh, much faster than any of the other eigenfrequencies in the system which are relevant to consider. So if you do that, um, you find out that the relaxation rate Rj enters at second order perturbation, uh, and it enters like this. So um, in addition to Rj, it's also multiplied by some some factor involving the J couplings or invo involving the coherent part. So, if you if you know anything about um, matrix perturbation theory, then you know that to take second order, you, uh, you take the off diagonal elements uh, divided by the difference in uh, uh, diagonal elements all squared, and then that's the component by which you multiply the perturbation. Um, so then the argument is that 
this term is small. Uh, this term is small because uh, we have a large coupling on the bottom, uh, which is, say, makes new J negligible. And as in this particular case for benzene, then the uh, uh, the effective J coupling is, uh, say, an order of magnitude larger than, than the effective J coupling. Um, that's reducing this contribution of RJ to only um, percent. Um, so this is a second order, uh, say, justification of uh, sec, uh, it's a so-called scalar relaxation of the second kind, uh, not being able to effectively relax the long-lived coherence in, in this system. Um, there is something else to consider, by the way. So we have extra spins in the molecule. So we would expect to have extra dipole-dipole couplings between the reference system and, uh, and, and then, the, then the perturbating spins. Um, but again, uh, geometry is uh, helping us out here. So the uh, the dipole-dipole coupling, um, when it enters uh, relaxation rates at, at first order goes like distance to the minus six. Uh, and the distance between say this carbon 13 and uh, the hydrogen next door to it, um, the dipole-dipole coupling there um, to, the, to the power of six, uh, when you can compare it to, to the dipole-dipole coupling, uh, which is within the reference system to the power of six, that again works out to be only percent. So we have some arguments based on uh, perturbation theory to suggest why long-lived coherences also exist in uh, multi-spin systems. Michael, can I um, please yeah, ask? Uh, there are actually a number of questions. Uh, so um, there is a question from Quentin. Uh, so here are you using uh, Redfield theory or directly calculating the rates with perturbation theory? So um, in fact here, Redfield theory is uh, not used at all. So red, red field theory refers to the way in which these relaxation rates are calculated. Here I'm simply assuming that there is an eigenmode of the spin system with a certain relaxation rate. Um, but, but this is based on approximations. It's, it's based on the... Um, uh, so ignoring the, the, the thermal equilibrium state of the, of the spin system which I would say is a good approximation at zero fields. Uh, why? Because at, at zero fields, then uh, to, for, for all good purposes, the, the zero uh, spin order within the spin system, um, certainly in benzene, but maybe not for special cases like hydrogen. So uh, yeah, there is a... Additional question from Ilya. Surely long-lived coherence is a symmetry effect that should persist in one form or another at any field. Uh, right. Yes, so I expect that the, um, the um, so, so speaking a bit more um, technically, uh, you can consider solving this uh, this system to make uh, uh, eigen, eigen um, modes of spin order and then identifying whether they have uh, long-lived properties or not. Um, but there are some arguments that you could say that uh, such general such um, such eigen modes are uh, very close to those of the, the reference system itself. Okay, so uh, there is also a discussion uh, about natural abundance of carbon cetine in benzene. Uh, so it's, uh, can you comment? Uh, you, you previously uh, there was a number six percent. And uh, right, okay. So if, well, um, if we simply assume that the abundance of carbon thirteen on one of the um, one of the carbon positions in the molecule is about 1%. Um, then you, you should be able to work out what the probability is that it's it's on at least one of those positions. 
Um, so if, if it's simply on one of those positions, then it is uh, it is six times the probability of being on one carbon. Um, so that results in six percent. If you want to um, uh, if you want to calculate the probability of there being two carbon thirteens in, in the molecule, then you can use the uh, by binomial math that that you normally use. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's convincing. Let me check. Um, uh, there are probably some other questions. Uh, in the derivation of the of dipolar alphabet. Uh, OK, so there was actually also a question about alphabet. Um, and uh, wait, I, I should find it. I'm sorry. Um, how are dipolar alphabets modified at zero magnetic field? Um, again, I think this is a very technical question. Um, so the, the dipolar alphabet refers to, um, uh, so if you have a dipole-dipole coupling, then you can split that into terms uh, which are given uh, a letter of the alphabet, and then um, and then some of those uh, terms are uh, are involved in relaxation processes uh, in high magnetic field, and some of them are not, or some are re responsible for cross relaxation uh, between nuclei, and other others are not. Um, so. I think I'll comment on that simply by saying that um, so at zero field, then the dipole-dipole coupling um, form of, of the relaxation uh, is exactly the same. Um, but it is true that these various dipolar coupling, dipolar um, alphabet contributions, as you say, uh, contribute in different ways. But again, I think that's more uh, that, that's more related to the discussion on relaxation that we will have later in the week. Yeah, thank you. I, I, also, one last uh, question, I guess, for the slide. Um, so uh, this spectrum, uh, is it for uh, carbon-13 enriched uh, compound or for natural abundance? So this was taken from the paper. Um, let's see if we can find it again. I think actually John commented that uh, <laughs> yeah. it is John's paper, so yeah, it comes from this paper here. Yeah, it's enriched uh, compound. Yeah, uh, I believe it is not isotopically enriched. Um, the natural yeah. abundance of carbon thirteen, again, the six percent in in this molecule was high enough that uh, one can observe um, a zero field spectrum without. Uh, having to wait too long uh, to accumulate uh, sufficient signal to noise. There's a, so that means that 93% of the sample is carbon 12. Okay, but if we're at zero field, um, then we can use the arguments that we used in the, or that we saw in the first part of the talk to say that there will not be any uh, observable signal at zero field. For, for that component of the sample, except at zero frequency. So we can ignore the part of the sample which does not contain carbon-13, the part which only contains hydrogen um, for, for this experiment. I, I guess that is another nice feature of um, carbon-13 uh, Zulf NMR um, if you want to work with natural abundance compounds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, I just want uh, to to um, to ask, is it all right to finish in 15 minutes? Well, in fact, we were uh, we were we were on time. So um, right after this slide was my last one. Oh, uh, nice. So I wanted to summarize what we learned. Uh, so I wanted to show you some uh, interesting features of uh, zero field NMR. Um, in, in molecules which are more co more complex, so they have m more than two inequivalent groups, um, and then 
uh, particularly in uh, systems with carbon-13, which is directly bonded to hydrogen, then we can use, uh, we, we can very often use perturbative uh, arguments uh, to explain what we see in zero and ultra low field NMR spectra. So one, one example of that was um, often we can uh, predict a spectrum at first order uh, to, um, to a very good agreement. Uh, and then some arguments which, uh, which say we're a little bit um, hand, hand wavy, but have some basis in theory of uh, why long net coherences also lead to uh, these very, very narrow lines. Uh, in the case of multi-spin systems, which can be very useful, again, if we're interested in precision spectroscopy. Uh, so with that, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Michael. This is a beautiful uh, lecture and a very interesting talk. Um, probably there are some questions. Uh, and also, thank you for staying in time. Uh, Oh, I want to mention one more thing that I forgot. Yes, Sorry. sure. You, 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 um, if you want to read more about um, long-lived coherences, uh, I should say that long-lived coherences were, in fact, discovered in uh, high-field NMR um, long before they were identified as contributing to narrow lines in zero-field NMR, uh, and that was uh, that was work all done by. Uh, Jeffrey Bowden, Housen's group. So I refer you to these two papers here if you want to, to find out more about that. And then um, and they will tell you everything that you need to know about long-lived coherences. And then uh, another paper, if you're interested, uh, is this really nice paper, theory paper, with some experimental results uh, from Stefan Appelt, um, where he talks about uh, these the system where you have um, two inequivalent spin species, but one J coupling, and how the spectrum change, how the NMR spectrum changes as you go through these different uh, uh, field ranges from uh, very high field down to uh, very low fields. So going from uh, weak coupling to strong coupling, and the regimes that we've uh, looked at in this talk are only uh, a small portion of uh, the, uh, the regimes which you can classify for, for this sort of system. We only looked at zero field, uh, and we looked at briefly at uh, J-couplings being perturbative in high field, but then there's some very uh, sometimes interesting and, and rich behavior that happens in between, and I believe that's the basis for many of the um, para-hydrogen enhanced type experiments, which happen at, at, lit, at zero field or Earth's field or millitesla fields. And again, I hope we hear about those in this conference. I look forward to that. Right. Um, thank you. So uh, there are actually some questions. Um, there, are, there are two questions from Raman um, about uh, portable setup. Uh, so the first question is, is there any thermal isolation in uh, place to keep the sample much colder than the vapor cell? 30 degrees, we see 150 degrees. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, coming back here, um, yeah. So uh, thermal management in, in our setup is, is quite important because we have a, a hot rubidium uh, vapor, which is about 150 degrees. Um, and that should be as close as possible to the NMR sample to maximize the efficiency of pickup of the, the magnetization from the NMR, or the magnetic field from the NMR sample to the magnetometer. Uh, we have additional uh, therm thermal management from this uh, polarization coil. Uh, so at 20 millitesla, we're applying several amps of current through that coil and it gets hot unless you have a cooling system. So we have uh, this part um, um, in some kind of uh, fluid cooling jacket, uh, which is um, designed so that it minimizes, again, additional standoff between the sample and the, the magnetometer. And it turns out that we can run the 20 millitesla pre-polarizing field indefinitely, so for many hours, if we really wanted to. 
Um, and then the cooling system would uh, keep the sample temperature near to ambient. Nice. Uh, the second question, uh, with uh, with this very uh, low 20 millitesla pre-polarizing field, what is the single shot SNR that you obtain for, say, bulk uh, carbon cetine uh, formic acid? Um, well, so as a first comment, I wouldn't call the 20 millitesla field low. It's uh, we, we struggle to get above this. So I think that if we if we had some more elaborate cooling system or we used a smaller coil for pre-polarizing, we might be able to get this up to 100 millitesla. Uh, but I wouldn't call this low. And in fact, this is this is pretty high when you consider that uh, we want to avoid um, magnetizing the magnetic shields. Um, so, but then, yeah, to benchmark uh, signal to noise, I can't give you a, a value for signal to noise of formic acid. Um, so we, we were focusing more on proton precession in, um, in, in bulk liquids, but again, hopefully this demonstration with the, the orange, uh, the next time you eat an orange, take a look at the vesicle and, and see how, how small it is. Um, that this is signal coming from that amount of sample in the pre-polarizing field. And again, in the in the demo that, that Sven showed, um, he was showing signal to noise of, uh, uh, say, uh, 50, 50 to 100 for, um, say, samples of water, which are about this size. You can, you can see that on the camera, like a milliliter of water. 